All right. This is part two. We have 18 minutes and 45 seconds of pure hell. This is actually unofficially the very first battle where nuclear weapons were used. I just said it can't be wrong. With the formidable town of Harfleur now under English control, King Henry faced a dilemma. His strategic goal were the urban centers and fortifications of northern France, which, once conquered, would serve as bases from where his troops and administrators could subjugate and tax the surrounding countryside to pay off the war effort. This plan gained widespread support from the people and the magnates, and large sums were borrowed to finance the campaign, in part through parliamentary taxation. But the siege of Harfleur proved costly. The English army was worn down by casualties and disease, and winter was just around the corner. Worse, reports came of French forces being assembled near Rouen. It was clear that Henry's ambitious plans had to be put on hold. At a council meeting, the king was advised to garrison Harfleur and sail back to England so his troops could recover. But Henry knew that conquering the principal North French port alone would not produce a sense of victory and authority he needed to secure his position at home, nor would it cover the vast borrowings for the campaign. <laughs> Let's do some sightseeing instead. I don't want to see She-Hulk's boobs right now. Let's get to the killing. Thank you. Ignoring his counselors, Henry led his forces out of Harfleur, planning a swift mounted march to Calais. He sent orders to Governor William Bardolph to ride to the Somme estuary and secure the crossing point for the incoming English army. Henry's advisers argued that sailing through the channel would be safer, but the king wanted to demonstrate that he could pillage northern France with impunity, lands that he claimed were his. However, upon learning of Henry's departure from Harfleur, the constable of France, Charles d'Albret, went after him. He urged local nobles to mobilize their retinues and help contain the invaders west of the Somme, where he planned to trap and destroy them. Three days into the march, the English reached the river, but there was no sign of Bardolf and his host. Instead, French forces blocked the river crossing. Henry's plan for a fast campaign had backfired. With the French gathering, the English king was forced to lead his army upstream to avoid being surrounded. But Charles placed his forces well. Fords and bridges were either heavily guarded or destroyed. Knowing that Henry would have to move along the Somme, the Constable of France advanced with the main body towards the flat plains near Peron, intending to intercept and give battle to the invaders. French sorties were sent to harass and soften up the English column. But then, inexplicably, Henry moved away from the river, heading southeast. It has been suggested that during one of the sorties, some of the French soldiers were captured and interrogated. If intelligence was indeed gathered that Charles was waiting near Peron, it would explain Henry's subsequent move southeast to avoid the trap. Far away from Calais and safety, English troops were dejected by rumors of a possible battle concerned that they would be easily cornered and overwhelmed near the river. Then, at last, 11 days... How do they hear these rumors? I, I, I love hearing that type of stuff. And then rumors circulated amongst the men. Yeah? Did anyone from the outside tell them any of this? Oh, it was just one guy who says, Oh, I think we're going to get killed when we get by the river. Pass it on. Oh. That's the person you gotta just execute right away. ...into the march, 
scouts found an unguarded ford. Once across the Somme, Henry moved around the French position at Peron. The journey, however, turned from a fast 230-kilometer march along the coast into a 426-kilometer trek across France. Wow. The troops were tired, hungry, and sick. And just when he thought that he had evaded the enemy, French heralds brought an ominous letter. In it, Charla informed Henry that they would do battle before he reached Calais. The king promptly force-marched his army northwest, cutting straight towards Calais in the hope of outrunning the French. But then, scouts rode back at speed with alarming news. Having learned that the English forded the Somme, the Constable of France departed from Peron on the same day, successfully overtaking Henry, and was now blocking his line of march near the castle of Agincourt. The English were cut off from Calais. With no major action taking place on the first day, the two armies settled in for the night. In the French camp, meals were served and men yelled out for their servants, pages and friends, with the noise reaching the English. Some music, played to keep the spirits up, and loud boasting between soldiers at dinner was not unusual, especially on the eve of battle. But in stark contrast across the field, Henry instilled absolute discipline, ordering the troops to maintain silence in the camp. He wanted his men to remain focused and be on their guard, fearing a possible surprise mounted attack by the French during the night. Insisting that his troops keep their guard up proved wise. Silence or I'll cut your ears off. Shouldn't it be silence or I'll cut your tongues out? Ugh, nah. Because it... If you cut their ears off, that's... It's just rude. But then you cut their tongues out. Why am I debating this? It doesn't matter. When a mounted French party of men-at-arms and archers suddenly appeared during the night, they came close enough for there to be a brief exchange of missiles. A few English archers were reportedly captured, but without the true element of surprise, the French contingent rode back. Heavy rain and cold weather created miserable conditions for the men camping out overnight. But the king kept touring the camp, encouraging the troops ahead of the battle. looks so fun oh I can't wait to play this game oh I want to play it right now it, oh darn doesn't that bother you okay you're all up in my face aren't you all up in my face next morning on Saint Crispin's Day the French began deploying some time after first light while the English army left their tents well before dawn as Henry wanted to be the first to deploy in an effort to show the enemy that his men were eager to fight. In the light of day, Henry was quick to realize that the dreadful rain from the night prior created an unexpected opportunity. The soil of the recently plowed fields, sown with winter cereals, was not the fine loam of the vineyards of France, but the thick clay of the Somme that retained much of the rainwater, turning the ground into a sticky quagmire. Aware that this would slow down any attack by cavalry or infantry, the king formed a defensive line, posting three divisions of dismounted men-at-arms in the center, with small groups of archers between each division, and two large contingents of longbowmen on each flank, in a concaved formation. The bowmen fixed sharpened stakes into the ground in front of them to disrupt the enemy's cavalry charge and impale their horses. 200 mounted archers were secretly sent through the wooded area on the flank with orders to wait for the signal. This was a risky maneuver as contingents of both armies patrolled the area around the battlefield. 
Meanwhile, Charles and the French leadership deployed two lines of several thousand infantrymen and dismounted men-at-arms, placing archers and crossbowmen between the divisions, with contingents of cavalry on the flanks, while the third line was largely composed of mounted men-at-arms. A few chroniclers mention artillery pieces, but it appears those played no part in the battle. The size of the two armies is still hotly debated. Accounting for the losses at half floor and the garrison left to guard the town, Henry was left with around 6,000 troops for the campaign, comprised of around 1,000 men-at-arms and 5,000 archers. Meanwhile, the notion of a vast French army is out of context for medieval history. Prior to 1415 AD, the last time a French king was able to muster 15 to 16,000 men was in the 1380s, and these were drawn from the whole kingdom, while in 1415 AD there was very little recruitment south of the Loire. The excellent research done by Professor Anne Curry shows that it would have been difficult for the French to field more than 12,000 troops at Agincourt. Furthermore, even if it was just 12,000, they're, they're double. So, I mean. Or contemporary French records of military financial expenses for the 1415 campaign show that 6,000 men at arms and 3,000 archers were recruited with additional men assembled in the weeks prior to the battle, for a total of around 12,000 troops. Still, the French outnumbered the English up to two to one. Yeah. But the biggest difference between the two armies was in the numbers of men-at-arms, a five-to-one ratio in favor of the French. Wow. To learn more on this, links to Anne Curry's books and articles from the University of Southampton and Future Learn are in the sources below. Both armies were fully deployed by 7 a.m., but the standoff continued for another three to four hours. The men hurled insults at each other, but the constable <laughs> of France was in no hurry, and Henry was outnumbered. Neither side wanted to make the first move. However, the English were desperately low on food and supplies, while the French were well provisioned, with some of the older nobles suggesting that they should just simply wait and let the English go hungry. And as lunchtime approached around 11 a.m., many French nobles sent their servants to fetch meals, while others mounted their horses to trot around and keep them warm. Seeing that the enemy was willing to wait and starve him out, Henry made a bold decision. He gave the order, Banners forward! Archers pulled their hedgehog of sharpened stakes from the ground and carried them forward to the new battle line. Surprised to see the English line advancing, French divisions began to sort themselves out. Then came Henry's signal for the bowmen hidden in the trees. The 200 archers unleashed on the French. With the arrow volleys came the shouting of hunting calls, designed to make it seem like the act of shooting at French nobles was no different than hunting wild hogs in the forest. This was a deep insult for the French nobility, who didn't even recognize the existence of the low-born English archers. Enraged, the French were goaded into advancing forward. Just when it seemed that the two armies were charging towards each other, Henry ordered the men to stop once they reached the extreme longbow range, and the archers quickly went about replanting the sharp wooden stakes in front of the line. French mounted knights on either flank rode ahead of the main line, tasked with breaking the large contingents of English archers to allow the dismounted heavily armored men-at-arms to close in. However, the ploughed, muddy field slowed them down, and they soon rode into a virtual storm of arrows. English and Welsh archers in Henry's army carried more powerful bows than those used by their forefathers, and the armor-piercing arrowheads made the weapon much deadlier than its predecessor. The arrow volleys cut down many of the knights. Wounded and frightened horses threw their riders and galloped from the fray in panic back towards the main French line, with some crashing into the incoming infantry, 
trampling over the men-at-arms and breaking their cohesion. Soon enough, the cavalry charge faltered. Most of the survivors fled back, stumbling past their comrades in terror, while a few brave men rejoined the attack. The first French division slogged their way forward through the mud under a constant barrage. Younger, more hot-headed nobles predicted that the English would be struck with fear by the approach of so many knights and men-at-arms. That they were not was the result of the damage that their arrows had caused. How many arrows did each um, archer usually carry into a battle? Because it's not like, well, I wouldn't think you're making them on the spot. That takes time. And I'm I would, I would, I would guess you would have some kind of supply line that would be able to afford you to get new arrows, but I didn't hear anything about a supply, supply line, supply, supply train. So, I mean, I'm just curious. I mean, I obviously I know there's a lot of them, so they all can fire arch uh, arrows, but man, you got to figure. And what, when the archers ran out of arrows. What did they do then? Did they then pull out a sword and fight? Or did they scoop up free arrows where they could and continue to, to fire that way? Seems like a basic question. Just, I, I don't, I'm just curious. By the time the French reached the enemy, they were close to exhaustion, some wounded by arrows. Still, some? the sheer weight of their numbers pushed the English back, but at a heavy price. Many French men-at-arms shortened their lances in anticipation of quickly closing in on the English. Shorter weapons would have given them an advantage in close quarters, but now the English had a longer reach, jabbing at the less protected legs and groin of the advancing French. Those mortally wounded fell, and others piled up on top of them, many still alive who simply fell in the crush. The second French division straggled into the fight, but this only made matters worse. Pressing the first division from the back failed to add any momentum to the attack and only caused more confusion in the ranks. With the English line stretched thin, archers dropped their bows and joined the melee, pulling out their swords, axes, hammers and daggers to add to the defense of the line. Being more lightly armored, the bowmen maneuvered their way in the mud much easier cutting straight into the enemy formation. Um, my question was just answered. Thank you. With no reserves to speak of, King Henry himself took part in the fighting. As the mauling of the French men-at-arms continued, with many captured for ransom after the encounter. Within two hours, both sides ran out of steam, and the battle was decided. Those French who survived staggered back towards the uncommitted 3rd French Division, now uncertain if they should join the fighting. As the English were catching their breath, a local French lord appeared behind the English line, leading a group of knights and a mob of peasants. Perhaps their plan was to attack Henry's rear, but they soon descended on the English camp, capturing the king's beddings and one of his spare crowns. Unsure if the French would regroup and he would become trapped between two enemy contingents, Henry ordered the slaughter of prisoners to prevent them from joining a possible third French attack. As the systematic killing of prisoners unfolded, Henry sent a herald to the third French division, ordering them off the battlefield. The third French line withdrew from the field soon after. On the English side, Casualties are thought to have been no greater than 600. Earl of Suffolk died, as did the Duke of York, trampled to death in the mud. Henry himself defended his badly wounded brother, the Duke of Gloucester, in the heat of battle. Meanwhile, on the French side, five grave pits were dug, each filled with between 1,000 and 1,200 dead. Around 5,000 perished, though this number may have been higher. The Constable of France died in the fighting, so did the Duke of Alençon, as well as Boussicourt, along with many prominent knights and nobles. 
This most incredible of triumphs had put the Kingdom of France on its knees. The capture of Harfleur and the victory at Agincourt made Henry V a national hero in a kingdom only beginning to feel as a nation. In just a few short weeks, Henry had risen to become the diplomatic arbiter of Europe, getting a visit from the King of Hungary, later the Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund in 1416, with whom he entered into an alliance that would serve him well. Later he returned to France to realize his plan of conquering Normandy. Rouen, the capital of northern France, surrendered in 1419. Later that same year, the murder of Duke John the Fearless secured him a Burgundian alliance. These successes forced the French to agree to terms outlined in the Treaty of Troyes in 1420, recognizing Henry as the heir to the French throne and regent of France. <laughs> Catherine, King Charles' daughter, was married to him. Still a young king, he was now at the height of his power, but these triumphs would not last as his health deteriorated during the sieges of Moulin and Meaux. Aged only 36, he died at the Chateau of Vincennes in 1422, likely of dysentery. Credit goes to our awesome patrons. Well, it's good that uh, Henry realized he recognized that the the field and he made them cross it hmm wonder what i wonder why the french didn't notice that and if they did why they would want to cross it you know but i don't know i wasn't there We'll never know. So, uh, this was a request. Two parts. Two parts are Dunskis now. I liked it. Hundred Years' War. Something I'll have to take a look at a little more thoroughly. Sorry, my chin itched. But I'm going to go ahead and end this here. Um, like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Have a good day. Have a good night.